everyone. My name is Renaud Daniels, Vice President, Multimedia and Event Sponsorship Sales. I hope you enjoyed the first day of the Women of Power Tech Summit. I can assure you, you will find day two to be equally as enlightening. Our Women of Power Tech Virtual Summit is such an important conference of Black Enterprise and our team who have worked tirelessly to make it happen for you, our audience. But I must say that this achievement is not done in a vacuum or without a lot of support. Our sponsors are equally responsible for the success of this event and the Women of Power franchise. With that, I would like to take a few moments to thank our sponsors that truly made this summit come together in the way it has. Beginning with our title sponsor, Ally. Ally will host today's session, This Woman's Work, Breaking Down Barriers. Our presenting sponsor, Cadillac. Cadillac will host today's session on innovation, building a better mousetrap. To our platinum sponsors, BlackRock, Capital One. Capital One hosted yesterday's session using technology for good. Merck, United Health Group featuring Optum and Walmart. To our corporate sponsors, Fidelity Investments, AT&T, PayPal, and Salesforce. Please join me in thanking the 2021 Black Enterprise Women of Power Tech Summit sponsors. Again, it was truly a pleasure working with you all, and I look forward to planning the 2022 Women of Power and Women of Power Tech Summits. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our next session, Follow the Money, the Rise of Social Media Influencers, moderated by Selena Hill, Black Enterprises Deputy Digital Editor. I'm Selena Hill, the Deputy Digital Editor at Black Enterprise, and I hope you're enjoying the Women of Power Tech Summit. During this next session, we'll unpack trends and shifts in influencer marketing, which is now an estimated $10 billion industry. So we invited two social media experts to share how they've successfully built a digital community, partnered with established brands, and monetized their reach. First, we have Shan Cabs, who is the matriarch of one of the most beloved families on YouTube, the Cabs family. Their popular YouTube channel has amassed more than a million subscribers, while their videos have received nearly 200 million combined views on YouTube alone. We also have Cache Jackson Henderson, who is a Texas-based blogger, content creator, creative community organizer, marketing consultant, and the CEO and founder of the Cache Life Lifestyle Blog. Thank you, ladies, so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having Thank us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So I want to start this conversation by talking about your leap into social media. Shan, both you and your husband, Tay, had full-time jobs just a few years ago. He was working as a sky engineer and you were a cardiac technician. Mm -hmm. However, you both quit your jobs to manage your YouTube channel full time. What triggered you and your husband to take that leap? We felt like if we didn't do it then, like as in last year, we were never going to do it. And the way that things were on a roll, we were very confident that, you know, this is going to work. We all enjoyed it. It was giving us so much time together as a family and still be able to, you know, enter a new career. So we thought, why not? It's, you know, you have to jump at faith and take a risk sometimes. And if it works, brilliant. If it doesn't, then you start all over again. Did you reach a certain um, number or milestone? Um, was there any like data or statistics that led you to take that leap at that time? I think it was the... The way that our numbers were growing so rapidly, we knew that this was something that people were enjoying. So we thought if we don't give it 100% now, it's the, the way that we were giving it 100% at the time is because I was on maternity leave. So I felt like if I go back, then I wouldn't be able to give it as much 
um, effort as you know what we were giving it at the time. So the, the numbers were growing, it made sense and we were all flowing in it very nicely. And it was just, it's such an amazing career change that we were, yeah, we just had to give it 100%. Amazing, amazing. Now, Cache, before you became an entrepreneur, you worked for ad agencies and in-house on brand marketing teams. What inspired you to launch your own social media marketing consulting company? Well, like many, um, my blog and brand was kind of a side hustle when I was working at these um, firms. And um, I went started monetizing them um, while on those teams, um, when you work for marketing teams, unfortunately, sometimes if uh, you lose a client at an agency, oftentimes the team um, gets cut. <laughs> so while some would say, oh, I took the big leap into entrepreneurship, I actually kind of got the push. And because I had such a really established personal brand, um, I had so many connections in the industry, it was actually a pretty easy transition for me. Um, I put together a plan and gave myself a timeline. I hit the pavement and I got my first client within 30 days. I signed a year long contract and that was definitely like the anchor for, um, I'd say my multi <laughs> revenue streams um, as an independent, um, I'll just say contractor turned LLC. So um, that was about six years ago. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been, an, it's been an that's an amazing. What type of client was it that you signed on? Right. It was a social media uh, management uh, client, which kind of went right into the realm of what I was doing with, I mean, I, my own personal brand, um, you know, as I'm sure Shan knows when you are creating content, you're doing it for multi channels. Um, you're being the producer, the copywriter, you know, all of the things, especially at some of the early stages. So it was an easy transition to go from having that more brand strategy mindset um, and skill set to being actually a full-time manager and community manager and helping um, you know, your clients and fielding community inquiries. So um, I've done that in the financial tech and uh, food and beverage space. So it's been a lot of fun. So Shan, many of us have seen so many of your videos. You have the cutest family. I mean, all of your children seem like they're natural performers constantly going viral. You've been on everywhere from Good Morning America to BBC. Um, when you decided to jump full-time into becoming a YouTuber, um, how were you able to monetize and make sure that your salaries, um, the salaries that you lost as a full-time worker uh, was being compensated? We've, um, you know, we don't usually discuss our revenue, but we have, we have been able to, we've done a, quite a few brand deals, to be honest, which we're very blessed in the sense that our family and our original content has led us to do so many um, brand collaborations, Netflix, Barbie, Lego, etc. So I think as long as we're able to keep up our old lifestyle and, you know, we're still comfortable living that way, then the collaborations that we do have to match what we're comfortable living on. Absolutely. Cache, what tips and advice and strategies do you normally share with clients about monetizing their social media accounts? Well, first, um, you, you have to do this because you enjoy it and because you love it. You have to do it without worrying about the check. And, you know, I know that some people do go into influencing, like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to make this much money. And while I think you have to have those goals and you need to be able to see a long term plan, I, there has to be that passion that fuels you because there are going to be seasons like there are in any level of business where you're burning the midnight oil. And that has to be kind of your true north as you're going through this process. So first, I'd say to be very consistent. Um, have a schedule and stick to it. That doesn't mean it has to be every day, whatever works for you, but kind of get the people that are following you trained to know what to expect. Consistency can be time, aesthetic, tone, all of that. Um, from there, I would always say keeping people engaged, being very professional, whether that is through going live, doing more video, um, but just really understanding your community. And I think a lot of this 
people think they need to have a certain amount of followers or be doing this a certain amount of time in order to monetize. But honestly, if you're consistent and your message and mission is clear, it just takes the confidence to go ahead and ask. You really need to know what's in it for the brand that you want to collaborate with. That's why it's so important to work with brands that align with your core values and in your, you know, your um, content mix, because it needs, there has to be some authentic connection. Like if I'm always talking about travel and lifestyle, me all of a sudden talking about family might seem a little bit random unless I set the tone for that. Um, so those would be some of my first tips, but confidence will get you far. If you can get into a brand psyche a little bit, learn what's important to them, find what those core connections are, um, pay attention to what they're doing in the news. Did they launch a new product? Are they expanding to your area? That's your hook that is going to get your brand contacts connection and start the conversation to figure out what you can do together. Because oftentimes I find that it's beyond just social media content. Sometimes you can become an extra voice internally. You can be a consultant for them and do additional work. You can give them images and sell them so that they can use them for their marketing, especially in times like this where production budgets are cut a little bit. And, you know, last year as we've been navigating hashtag 2020 and all of the changes that came with it. Um, there's a, there's a lot of room to monetize that doesn't actually have to deal with your direct Instagram account. So, well, and, and when you say like, there's a lot of room to monetize, I know there are different avenues, Cache. Can you talk about the different ways people um, monetize, like obviously brand partnerships, uh, ads? Uh, I know YouTube as a platform itself allows content creators to really generate a lot of money just on the platform. So if you can talk briefly about those avenues and then tell us how would a content creator know which to choose or focus on? I think you just listed some very great ways um, and I would and I would say yes to all of those. Um, additionally, there are different networks that you can work with um, to get started that way. Um, I think like there's Sway Group, She Speaks, Clever to begin. Um, from there, I would say uh, there's affiliate marketing. So if you can work with a network that way or work directly with a retailer that you enjoy, um, you can make a percentage of a sale. A lot of people do that um, for different products. But I'm also about, while it's great to work with brands and to monetize through platforms and networks and affiliate marketing, you know, kind of get your own hustle too, um, whether that's a product or service that you are sell selling. Um, if you have that personal brand, if you have a captive audience, if you have people that are listening and are influenced by you, test your influence by selling a product or by launching a course or an ebook or a workshop. Start small, maybe, if you want to try that out. Um, I've done many things over the years. I had candles last holiday. I've done mugs. Um, I do coaching and uh, workshops now for entrepreneurs that are kind of starting out in this industry. So always keep an iron in the fire. You can keep multiple at one time. You don't have to stay necessarily in one lane when it comes to monetization, but you do need to probably follow a schedule and start tracking all of that. So you're not over committing and then fumbling the ball. <laughs> no one likes that. Um, especially when it comes to a brand, uh, a brand that's receiving uh, the ball. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think we've seen so many changes during the pandemic um, on social media, uh, unscripted and less filtered or curated content became really popular. We also saw the rise of TikTok. Shan, did this affect the content that you and your family have been putting out? What, what pivots did you make during the pandemic? To be honest, the kind of content we make is very natural and very free flowing. So I personally think that every platform we do use, we're the same way in each. I mean, sometimes you can add a little, bit, a little bit of more humor to something. For example, TikTok, I find that it's a bit more humorous on there. So, you know, sometimes you can, you know, up the levels when it comes to connecting with your followers. Uh, but in terms of changing to um, fit every platform, I think we just did everything free flowing and just raw, just us in our raw state. 
Amazing. I know that some like it's the the content and the videos that your family create. They're really so good. I mean, they they garner millions of views. Um, how do you guys go into it? Do you guys say, hey, let's just turn the camera on. We're having a good time. Or do you allocate time to create content since that is your profession now? It depends. So for when we use Instagram stories, for example, those are in the moment times that are happening and we just want to, you know, bring our followers a bit closer to us as, you know, everything they do reflects on how, sorry, everything we do reflects on how they engage with us. So what we do at home, we've seen that they love when they see us at home, just being a regular family. So those type of things are not very structured but if we're going to do a youtube video and we're going somewhere for example then they have to be planned and organized and you know it does take a lot of, a lot of thought that goes into it because our children are young mm -hmm. so we have to think of you know a very very wide range of things when we are going to film those kind of things amazing amazing and last follow-up here so when you go into creating a production do you have like a production mindset um, or, or is it, you know, still something that is organically happening, you turn on the camera? I would say a bit of both. So we go in with a focus and we have a job that we have to execute, you know, we create content, but also we we are ourselves when we're doing this. So we might, you know, plan a date, a time, a location, things like that. But when we get there, we are ourselves. And those things kind of happen naturally because it is our family dynamic that people tune into. And I don't think you can, you, you can't plan your family dynamic. You just have to be yourself. Yeah, no, you really do. Uh, Cache, how did the pandemic affect your business and what pivots have you made? So the pandemic um, affected my business very, uh, in an interesting way. So about a month before lockdown, I relocated from Sacramento to Dallas. And in Sacramento, I had a, an event business. I was running um, creative networking events every month for a few years. Plus, I was doing on-air appearances regularly and, you know, just had become kind of, I guess, a localista, if you will. Um, so I kind of approached 2020, like, I'm going to go to Dallas. I'm going to solidify myself in this creative community and do all these things. And then like a month later, that was not possible. So things did kind of come a bit to a halt. Um, you know, obviously some dreams got put on hold until this year and so forth, but it really gave me an opportunity to get very clear and go back to the why and why I started. I shared a lot of my transition. So the content did, while I would say much of it is very editorial and produced, a lot of it was very much on the fly and the tone of my content definitely shifted to reach people where they were at. At this point, we were looking for toilet paper, paper towels, and trying not to go crazy in the house, right? So at that point, I, you know, I ended up getting a puppy. So I was sharing that journey. So it did become a lot more personal. And not that I wasn't personal before, but it's different when you're in the house and they're seeing how you live. And um, from there, it allowed me to kind of identify a need. There were people like me who said 2020 was going to be their year and they were going to monetize and they wanted to still do this for their business. And I still had all of this energy and hope, whereas a lot of people that were looking to me for advice did not. So that's when I kind of took my 60 plus person event every month mindset to how can I make, how can I create a safe space? for people and give them some tools and motivation, but also know how, because not everyone is a marketer um, to kind of make their dreams reality. So that's when my group coaching program officially started was actually last spring. And I've run about six of them since um, and also moved to one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. So that was a new stream um, of income and a way to connect with my audience that I hadn't had before. Um, mm. But it was, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, yeah. I do think one of my gifts is being able to share the knowledge that I have. I'm um, coming up on 10 years since I bought the first domain for my blog. Before it was the cache life, it was the lipstick giraffe. Mm -hmm. And I've learned a lot in 10 years. The industry has changed significantly. And, you know, it's, it's been a trip. <laughs> Yeah, and and before we we talk about those changes, you know, you said you, you you're coaching, uh, you have clientele and teaching them different social media strategies. Um, when you're when you're speaking to them, how much do you tell them to sort of lean into a niche and sort of craft 
you know, something or a strategy around that niche versus being themselves, which I think, you know, Shannon, her family have done very successfully. So what, what's that balance there? Well, I always tell people to be themselves, regardless of what their niche is. I mean, that's number one. And I do try to prepare a lot of my coaching while it is very much, here's how you pitch a brand. Here's how you get your media kit together. Here's how to put together like, you know, a launch it very, there's some mindset work in there too, because if you don't believe yourself and what you're putting out there and you're constantly doubting and second guessing and overthinking, and you're not putting it out there, then you're not going, you're, you're not going to go very far. And I, I know that sounds a little bit blunt, but it, it just is what it is. Um, you're not going to go as far as you could if you have more, po- you know, um, I guess a more abundance mindset, if you will. So I always encourage people to be themselves if they do want to get a little vulnerable and sh- share what's going on behind the curtain to do so. I think there is a piece of that that you must keep as a personal brand, especially if you're the face, because we are not puppets here. We are real people. We we love, we have fun, We but we hurt too. I mean, things happen, right? Um, but I think when there's the balance of keeping it to whatever it is that you're offering, always kind of have some call to action, even if you're not selling a product per se, if you want someone to read, you know, your blog, you got to tell them you got a blog to go to off of the platform. If you need someone to watch something, then you need, you know, and you have, you need a question or some engagement, you kind of need to ask for it because otherwise people are going to be passive. Um, I, I would say that. I really just encourage people to get, figure out what they truly want to do, but to put it out there and to not be afraid to ask for feedback. Mm -hmm. Um, That's how you get better. I think that's how you serve your audience better. And I think that's how you grow. Um, Shan, you know, Cache mentioned, uh, she sort of touched on the evolution of social media. She's been in the game for 10 years how have you noticed different changes or shifts since you began using uh, YouTube and social media? And how have these changes affected the content that you post? I would say the number one change that I've noticed is, especially after the pandemic, I think a lot of people just wanted to come on social media and find something that they relate to, something that made their day pass a lot quicker, and also something that was positive. So I think with what we were pushing out and showing everybody, it made, you know, it made them part of our family. And I think a lot of people were lonely in the times of the pandemics. So kind of being online and in our family, like in our home, I think that was the number one thing that I saw that shifted the way that people interacted with us and the way that they say, you know, you've made my day so much better or your daughter has made my day so much better. Those were the, the, that was the number one thing I think I've noticed this year. Cache, you know, same question. If you can delve into the evolution of social media, as you said, when you started off as a blogger 10 years ago, uh, blogging was a thing back then. Uh, we, we've seen that sort of come and go. Uh, can you talk about some of the shifts that and trends that you've noticed? Yes. So I would say definitely the quality of content has definitely changed. You know, I just on a personal level, like I went back in the archives of some like early blog posts and I was like, Ooh, I put that picture out there. Like, look at those shadows, that lighting's yellow, like what's going on. So I think, um, the act, like the literal act of creating content, the process has shifted to become more, um, I'll say more of a production, you know, you're, you, if, especially if you're working with a brand, you are having a shot list, you are working with a photographer or you're using certain equipment, but then there also is that piece it, it, it really is a delicate dance because there is that piece of needing to be super relatable and not seeming to, we'll say, perfect, right? So I think for me, I definitely see where people need to get their foot, dive into the video pool. And Shan is such an inspiration to me even for that, because while I've done so much, um, so many panels and done a lot of TV, I'm still a little video shy, you know, and I need to get out there too. So in order to stay relevant and reach new people. So, you know, I think it's about, it's about being able to adapt, um, paying attention to what the trends are. Um, And I'd say while Instagram and TikTok are going off right now, same with YouTube, don't forget, you know, I always tell content creators, like, don't forget about a home, a hub of some sort, whether that is like a web page or anything, as we know from the Instagram um, outage was that a couple weeks ago and no one could get on anything and paid campaigns were at a halt. 
Um, it's like, is your email list together? Is your website together? How are you going to reach people um, in, a, in a different way? So I think for me, it's just like the quality of content has gone up. Um, there is an expectation there that you're not just selling all of the time, that there actually is some storytelling and soul behind what one is doing. And that's something that I've tried to carry start then and something that I try to carry with me now and encourage others to do the same. Shan, your content and your channel, uh, it started out very organically. Uh, you know, I've read your, your backstory about how uh, your husband would simply wanted to, sh you know, show videos of you and uh, your family and your daughter to other family members, posted it on Facebook. And that, I think that first video received 100,000 views. Uh, now that you're here, how do you take that success and turn it into strategy uh, moving forward for your family? And what are some of the goals that you hope to reach in the future? Um, I would say, so it's funny what Kashe just said about Instagram being down not too long ago, which is what also has given us a lot more, um, we're broadening our minds a bit more. Like we've, you know, created the website now. So there's a cabsfamily.com website, which now, uh, we're able to communicate with people a lot more just in case something does happen and i think now we're a bit more um strategic with how we see our future being what our goals are what everybody's individual goals are and right now we're just working on pushing everybody into what avenue they want to do and just make this journey as long and as fun and as beautiful as possible Amazing. Do you have any specific goals that you want to reach? Maybe spin off channels, maybe delve into traditional broadcasts or television. I mean, I can see you guys with a reality show, but what, what are you aiming for? Mine, I love presenting. So that would be the main goal for me. That right now is what we're pushing on the most. For me personally, everybody has their own individual goals. My daughter, the one that's always singing, she loves to sing. She will sing as much as she can. Tasia, my oldest child, she loves to model, she loves to act. So we're just trying to really work on everyone's strength. My third one, I'm not so sure because he's just a baby, but I will say he is hilarious. So we don't know what avenue he's going to go into. And, and my, husband, my husband is a, you know, he's a DJ by nature. So this is something we're trying to push everyone into and just, you know, execute our goals, just execute them. You know, Cache, we're seeing so many social media stars become these superstars, right? We see TikTokers, um, you get these mega brand deals or, or television shows. Uh, we have seen even when I look at um, DeVal, I forget, I'm forgetting his last name, his, his wife's last name, but he started off on social media and now um, he, he he's on a TV show on uh, one of Tyler Perry shows, right? So Basically, I say that to say, can you talk more about how that transition is happening where you can, you know, you get a following and all of a sudden now you're you're in Hollywood. I think with that, I mean, you definitely have to be talented. You have to have something there and you have to have an audience. You have to have some metrics in order to be able to quantify, you know, your influence, right? But I think at that point, you got to think about a team. You have to think long-term. You need to bring in somebody who can speak that language because you might be really good at creating content. You might be really good at, we'll just say, I, I don't know, we'll say dancing, or you might be good at, you know, making amazing recipes. But if you don't know how to speak to an agent and you don't know how to do a screen test and you don't know how to do certain things, that's when you got to kind of sharpen some tools in your toolbox, which is fine because we all have to do that at one point or another. So if that is a route that one wants to go down, I say figure, like literally probably Google how to get a TV show. Sometimes people get discovered and that it just naturally happens, but oftentimes you got it, there's a little puppeteering happening <laughs> behind the, the, the scenes. So I would say be able to do some research um, on what's available, figure out some, ca some casting houses, whether that is through an agent or directly through, because you can be self-represented. Um, I think sky is the limit, but I always tell people this, whether they're starting out to work with a brand and they've never had a deal or they want to do something, just start doing it the way you'd want to do it anyway. So if you want to have a show and you're going into someone's house and you're helping them revamp something on a budget, 
just start doing that and put it on YouTube and put it on your social media. And that is going to act almost like you're real, right? Or like your portfolio. And sometimes people may find it, or sometimes you're going to have to shop it around. But I think it, it comes down to, I think, confidence and having a little bit of a strategy and taking the extra step to figure out who some of the key players are in the game that you want to play in. But isn't having a social media following a prerequisite now in order to work in Hollywood? You know, so many of my friends who go on casting calls to either be models or actors, they say during that call, they're asked, what is your following like? You know, how many followers do you have on Instagram? Is it mandatory? Um, being completely candid, I can't say if it's mandatory or not, but I don't think it's everything. Now, will it give you an advantage if you have an established audience already? Sure. But I do think at the end of the day, you could have a million followers and be hard to work with, unprofessional, and can't get a line out. So I don't think followers at the end of the day is what counts. It may give you a leg up if you've got something else to back it up. Absolutely. So, you know, we talk a lot about uh, the different trends now, the, your, your background and your careers and how you've gotten to this place. What would you say is the future of uh, social media? Um, how do you see it continuing to grow and evolve? We'll start with you, Shan. I think it's going, like you were just saying, some people go to castings and they ask about their following. I think Personally, I do think social media will be like the, um, the foundation for a lot of people's uh, come up and, you know, what they want to do. I think first and foremost, you always go to social media to see how somebody else is doing it. And usually you kind of imitate what they do before you get to where you want to be. So I think it's becoming the foundation for a lot of things like, you know, brands are looking out for influencers. Uh, TV, like you said, with um, DeVale going on to TV from influencing, I think it will become the foundation. Cache, what are your thoughts on the future of social media marketing and just social media? I think this is just the beginning and I think it's ever evolving and changing. Um, I don't think influencers are going anywhere. My hope for the industry as a whole is that, I mean, namely when it comes to influencers, that there is some sort of reg increased regulation on like there is protection for actors, there's SAG, there's all of that. There isn't that, I think they just started that for influencers. But when it comes to, you know, labor and rates and all of that, it very much still is, and I hate this term, but it's true, the Wild West. Um, there is there is no baseline sometimes for some of this. And I think th the career of being an influencer or content creator will be it will have to be more respected and I'll say regarded as it as a marketing manager would be or as a executive producer would be at an ad firm. Um, so that's what I hope to see. A video is not going anywhere. I see more live in the moment being even pushed out even more. Um, so I think, <laughs> I think we all got to get ready, keep our devices charged um, and just be nimble and able to pivot <laughs> and make some magic happen. <laughs> Absolutely. So we do have to begin to wrap this conversation, but Shan, did you have any other final thoughts or, or advice that you wanted to share? Um, I was going to touch on what Kishay said earlier about the confidence. Anyone who does want to get into influencing social, any type of social media, the starting point is the confidence. I think when I was first starting out, I don't think I had that confidence, so I would doubt myself a lot. But now that I feel like we're a bit deeper into what we're doing, I do have that confidence to speak up. I can, you know, address something. So I feel like if you push yourself and believe in it and have the confidence, you will get to where you want to get to. And that's with every area of life. I just hope that a lot more women believe that in themselves and see that and just execute and go for it. And thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Cache, final thoughts? You know, I, we've been talking a lot about it from the creator side of things, but I, I want to just mention something to brands because I'm sure there are some brands that are watching and being part of the event. You know, 
I hope that when you engage influencers and content creators, you're thinking about it in the same way that you're thinking about what a photo shoot is for your brand. When it comes to how you're getting that whole production team and you're getting those photographers and you're paying for talent and you're getting wardrobe together and you're scouting locations, we do all of that sometimes on our own. Sometimes we have assistants and friends and we are constantly doing that. And granted, I've had some amazing brand deals. I've had to, and I have no problem negotiating and it is what it is, but I sometimes think that brand budgets for influencers don't match what level of work they want. And they're not really quantifying just how much they put into like a brand shoot or a campaign. I'm, there, there, there just needs to be a little more meeting in the middle on that, I think, from the brand side. And I'm not just saying that from my own experience, I'm saying it from the industry conversations I'm having with others, people that I've coached. And, you know, I, I just happen to know this because I, I used to work on set. <laughs> you know, I've, I've helped my teams do that. So um, my hope is that that's, that gets better over time. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, if you can just let our audience know how they can follow you and engage with the content that you're creating. Yes. So I'm the Cache Life, K-A-C-H-E-T Life on Instagram, cachelife.com. Um, hello at the cache life.com. Um, I would love to connect with you in chat. <laughs> Brand creator friend. Let's let's get it going. <laughs> Shan. <laughs> and to find my personal page is Shana underscore cabs and the family pages on Instagram, YouTube and Facebook. We are the cabs family. Amazing. Well, thank you too for an amazing conversation and being here with us at the Women of Power Tech Summit. Thank you. Thank you.